So Steve, you were one of the recording engineers on the Violator album. When it came to Enjoy the Silence in particular, to what extent was that song already finished when you started working on it? Well, the guitars had already been done, the famous guitar line. Mm -hmm. That had already been done. The change, uh, I wasn't aware that the track had changed from this kind of harmonium version, which was the demo, which actually we then redid. Uh, We re-recorded a version of that later with Martin singing. But that was already, you know, up and running. But we did, um, you know, the the riff on Policy of Truth, for example. I remember, you know, Alan on on the emu and we sampled a guitar and then he spun it backwards and he came up with a riff for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I say, you know, in various stages, but it had, it had already transformed itself. Well, I don't know it transformed, but it had already, you know, uh, become... Uh, you know the, the the bones of the hit that it was going to be. You know, no one no one anticipated how you know how, how big the, the track would be and how important it would be to the band at the time. But um, it was already there. Yeah, that's so cool. I was literally just going to ask you: Was there any expectation at all that this song was going to be a big hit? I mean, you said now no one thought it would be massive, but was there any thought it would actually do successfully to a degree? No, I don't think so because I wasn't really aware. At the time when I started working with them, I wasn't really aware of, of, of their history because, as I say, it was in the UK. It's a strange kind of bubble. They they weren't really in the mainstream. They weren't. I wouldn't say they weren't popular because they ended up playing you know massive gigs, but they just weren't in the in in that echelon. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you go to Germany, you go to France, you go to the States, you go outside the UK, you know the reception was incredible. Um, I mean, I went out to to Paris to record some gigs on the Violator tour and. I just, I just thought, wow, I had no idea, you know. Do you remember anything in particular when it came to experimenting with sound that you guys did with Enjoy the Silence? I thought the guitar sound was a, was really cool. And I remember asking, you know, talking to Flood, I was like, how did you get that? And that sounds really cool. And it was just, uh, you know, direct into the desk kind of sound. There's all kinds of bits and pieces, really interesting stuff. But the thing was, is that if it, it, one thing about it was if nothing was ever kept if it wasn't essential. Hmm. You know, there wasn't any periphery bits and pieces on the, on the tracks. Nothing really went through the, okay, that's fine scenario. Hmm. You know, even down to like the hi-hats on, 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 on stuff, um, you know, Join the Silence has, you know, got these kind of sequencer sounding, um, the sequencer sounds, excuse me, that, you know, sound a little bit like hi-hats um, from a, from a, from a drummer playing like a percussion sound. There was nothing periphery, hmm. you know, there was nothing left on there. If it, if it, if, if it didn't make a certain benchmark, it was off, you know. Interesting. Was there any one part of that song that was more difficult to record than others? From my end, from my point of view, I don't think it was anything that was really difficult to record on Violator. Um, it all kind of fell into place quite easily mm-hmm. uh, from my, from, certainly from my perspective. I mean, I have to talk to Alan and Flood really and Martin when Enjoy the Silence turned from the demo into what you know now, that was a collective decision. But I think that Alan, as the production head in the band, had a, a lot of creative input. So would it be fair to say that Alan was the creative leader of the band at the time? It depends on what song we were working on, mm-hmm. really. Interesting. So when it came to Enjoy the Silence or the Violator record as a whole, considering Depeche Mode is in many ways electronic oriented, was your approach to recording them different than it would have been, say, if they were more a traditional four piece rock band? You can't really compare, you know, like a four piece rock band to Depeche. I think, you know, they, they're quite they're quite different. Depeche is, is they're very particular uh, and had developed into a very particular kind of band where they do a bit like Nine Inch Nails, you know, it's an electronic rock band. They have, you know, very much the pop element as well because Martin just writes such great songs uh, as, you know, Trent does as well, but in, a, in quite a different way. But um, I don't think that you can necessarily compare one to the other. I think if it, if it was a general rule, I'd kind of say that there are really no boundaries as far as anything goes, really. There wouldn't be anything that would be you know, off bounds. I was always very much in favor of 
using also the desk as an instrument. So, you know, I'd run signals without getting too technical. I'd run signals through the desk, mm -hmm. off sense, distortions and delays and all these kind of things. You know, we're just kind of faffing about, you know, like we're working and enjoying what we were up to. And they go, oh, that's good. We're going to do a bit of that. You know, that was always really exciting. That's awesome. So when it came to Enjoy the Silence and the Violator record in general, did you personally work on Dave's vocals with the producer Flood? We did all the vocals apart from Personal Jesus. Okay, interesting. Um, and how is David to work with as a vocalist in the studio? Is there anything unique about his approach? How do you? How was it like working with him? Well, certainly when we when we were there, we did all kinds of different things. We had the classic setup of you know mic microphone and a shield and headphones and whatever. We did that. You know, Alan wanted Alan in particular, and obviously with Flood, they wanted a certain kind of vocal approach on certain things. So it was like, well. Let's get a 58, you know, just get a, a sure microphone, you know, like mm -hmm. just to so, so this, you know, and just get him to sing in the control room. So we, we, we set it up so Dave could sing, you know, kind of live, if you want, mm -hmm. in the control room. We did another one where we had, you know, the classic stage monitors in the studio on the floor. Mm -hmm. Dave singing on a, again on a, on a 58. I think, you know, they, they definitely pushed him, I thought. But I think the results were, were, were great. And Dave, Dave's a fantastic vocalist, you know. He's definitely got a, his own style, he's a brilliant front man. But they were definitely pushing him, you know, to try and get the results and the style of stuff that, that um, you know, they, Flood and Alan in particular, had in their head. Interesting. Was he more of like a one-to-take kind of guy or would he go on for several takes until they get the thing that they want? We used to do kind of, you know, we'd run through the whole song and then we definitely go back and do certain phrases uh, and, and go over bits and pieces. I mean, like with any vocalist, I, I don't think there's a cut and dried method. It depends on how you perceive that you're going to get the best results. And of course, I mean, you know, Alan had done how many albums by then with Depeche? Um, he'd been in a band like 10 years. So there was definitely a, an open mindedness to, to vary up the approach with Dave. I thought he was great in the studio. You know, he was really open-minded and performed brilliantly. But I mean, like everyone, I mean, you know, you can only sing for so long, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and because you lose, you lose, it's like play, playing any instrument. I mean, you can only do it for, you know, a couple of hours before, you know, you kind of wear out and lo lose that kind of edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he was a total professional, yeah. Interesting. So why did you guys choose to record Dave sometimes with a handheld microphone? The microphone thing, the 50, you know, what we called an SM58, um, mm. it's the style of mic that uh, most vocalists, even now, you know, then even now would use live. You tend to just perform differently when you've got a mic in your hand and you're listening back to, to speakers because most of the time vocalists don't wear headphones they only really wear headphones when in the studio mm -hmm. so i don't know if you've ever tried it yourself but <laughs> you know if you sing with headphones on your pitching is is it takes a while for you to kind of get your pitching together a lot of vocalists have one ear on one ear off kind of you know like yeah, this yeah. um because it's a you isolate the vibrations in your head and the sound and it just you, you just sound different um, and it's quite an alien environment, really. So to those who don't do it, it's quite difficult to understand what a big change that is. It's all about the performance at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, it's like you can have the best snare drum sound in the world, but if the song's crap, then it's not going to make any difference, is it? So it's the same thing. They were always conscious of trying to get that emotion, get that vibe, get it on the record. They were always very conscious of that. So uh, it, it never f bothered me. You know, a lot of engineers would go, oh, you know, what about, you know, you can hear the, the what they call the spill, you know, you can hear the backing track on the mic and stuff. It didn't bother me at all. You know, it was, once you get it in the out, once you get it in the record and you get the mix up, I'm like, it's like, no, you know, it, it, it's fine. Hmm. And in fact, just another quick story is when we ended up doing the devotional tour, mm -hmm. we, we did a, a live video. It was going to be a double live album, but it, it ended up just being, you know, Songs of Aiden ended up just being, you know, but it, well, <laughs> it ended up 
songs of faith and devotion live and in the live video we went to olympic and you know did the usual thing of set dave up with headphones and we did a few takes on some of the songs like that because obviously you know with live sometimes there's so much noise and the spill was just so big that the vocal sound did suffer a little bit and so you can kind of most people just do a little bit of cheating along the way and it just it didn't quite sound the same so i said to al well just get him to use a 58 you know like he does live just do that that's cool and most of the vocals came that way um for that um so it's a technique i still use now actually some of the engineers i've spoken to have said that they'll have vocalists they work with that they'll go for 20 minute periods and they'll take a break they'll go back for 20 more minutes take a break some vocalists will go for like three hours straight and then stop do you remember what more or less was his approach how could i say i i think it was until they felt that they had enough material to put then a composite vocal together and think okay right we've got that we've got that we've got a version of this we've got a version of the second verse we've got you know six seven versions of 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 you know choruses and stuff and then it would be it was alan and i would sit down and he'd have i you know it was all on analog at the time so you i'd play back all the different takes and he'd make his mark and then he'd say okay i want you know the first half of the verse from take three and i want the second half of the verse from take five and i'd be sitting there you know on the desk running the faders up and down we'd put a composite together Obviously, I mean, the producer was Flood. Alan is the main production head in the band, if you want. So the two of them very, very you know, led, 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 the, uh, led the strategy on that. So, you know, we put this, uh, these takes together, um, play them back to Dave. Some songs we redid. Some takes, you know, were, were done in a different kind of way, as I said, you know, with a microphone in his hand or... You know, with with the stage monitors, there's lots of different things that were that were were done for mm-hmm. production reasons. I mean, I think you know, me personally, uh, I liked the idea that it was more about the the sound and the emotion rather than getting you know the 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 best vocal sound in the world. Mm. I wouldn't say that the vocal sound is bad at all, actually, but. Uh, it didn't bother me or it didn't bother the guys that instead of using this, you know, 20,000 pound telefunk and whatever, or a Neumann, um, that we'd end up on a Shaw 58. You know, it was more to do with with the emotional side of it, um, which was something that I found really interesting considering that they were and still are, you know, an electronic band. So you'd think that they want everything, you know, in a square box and precise, but that wasn't the case. Hmm, interesting. One of the things to me that's interesting about Violator is that there's five different studios in four different countries credited as where the record yeah. was made. So, I mean, there's two different ones in London that was made um, that where it was recorded. Yeah. How much of the record was recorded in London and how much of it was recorded outside? Personal Jesus was already finished and mixed. I believe uh, it was mixed in Milan by, and I know it was mixed by Francois Kowalkin. Um, they'd been to Puck, which is this amazing studio in, in Denmark, kind of in the middle of nowhere. They'd started most of the songs. So Enjoy the Silence was was, was already there. Person of Jesus was already there. Um, no, not Person of Jesus, the Policy of Truth. They're all, you know, the bare structures were already in place. And the idea was, um, you know, like talking to the band was, well, we, you know, we've got overdubs to finish, we've got tracks to finish, but, you know, we've got vocals to do. And I think it kind of went on for about two months. So I was only supposed to be there a couple of weeks, but... <laughs> That's usually how it happens. You know, yeah. like, you know, seven years later, I'm still working in the band. But, um, yeah, so, I, you know, the, these tracks would come out. I mean, you know, we did a lot of work. I remember on Sweet's Perfection, the rolling drums that, you know, Alan played that, sampled it, put that in. As I say, you know, it, it's a while ago now, but I, I remember you know, the bare bones of, of most of the tracks there. We did the Toms on Clean, I remember. We did, you know, some stuff on Enjoy the Silence. We did stuff on all the tracks. 